means for various purposes. And in fact, could be used as means to various purposes that I give them, or be used as means to various purposes that you give them. So um, some object that you would like to eat, so it would be a means to some goal you have of um, satisfying your hunger. That object could also be used as a means to an end that I have, like for me to eat it, satisfying my hunger. Okay, and so there's a question, so, so mere objects for can be used for my purposes or for your purposes. So we need to have a way of deciding who gets to choose how objects are to be used. They don't have any natural purposes, but we can give them purposes when we use them. But there's a question about who gets to decide which purposes they're going to have. This is the problem of property for Kant. So property is simply a matter of deciding who gets to decide which ends some object will be used for. So property is a matter of justice. Justice isn't going to dictate what the proper end for some object is, whether the coconut should be eaten by somebody or made into a decoration. Justice is going to decide, determine who gets to decide that. Who gets to decide what end that will be used for? It's not going to dictate ends. So justice includes property, and so and so Kant thinks we need to come up with a scheme of property rights that will determine who gets to use what as means to their end. It might be irrelevant to what I um, Yeah, so Kant himself thinks, it's not irrelevant, Kant himself thinks that um, animals maybe have the core choice, but not ability. They don't have the capacity to give themselves ends. They don't act on the basis of, they can't act on the basis of pure practice. So they don't have ends, so they are mere objects that we give ends to. So we use them for our purposes. So from, from the point of view of justice, they have no rights. On the other hand, Kant does think that from the point of view of morality, from the point of view of virtue, we express and develop our um, our virtue, our morality, through our treatment of animals. So we get a kind of indirect requirements or um, indirect uh, constraints on our treatment of animals, not because we owe them anything, but a kind of indirect way through our virtue. That, so that's all I can really say. But the point is, from the point of view of the doctrine of right, animals have no rights. Well, what about more intelligent animals? And so for Kant, um, the question is whether they can act on the basis of pure practical reason. Look, we are not perfectly rational, but we do have that capacity. So if you would convince, if you are convinced, or if you could convince Kant that certain kinds of animals have that capacity, then they would count. Yeah. Was it Kant who said? <clears throat> that the reason we don't like abuse animals is not so much because of their but because their means and their ends or whatever, but because to do so would, look, would would make us look bad. It's not that it would make us look bad. It would sort of coarsen our um, sense of sense yeah, of it's not that's that's right. the effect on the animal, that's right. It's because of the effect it has on you of being that's right. Right. that's right. So as a matter of but my point now is as a matter of virtue, mm -hmm. not as a matter of right. Yeah. Okay, um, all right, so the big picture was starting with B, 
being entitled to use our own bodies for our own purposes. Then we notice that various objects could be used for different purposes, and we need some way of deciding who gets to determine which purposes some object will be used for. And therefore, we need a scheme of property rights. A scheme of property rights is precisely determining who owns what, who has a right to what things, and having a right to something exactly means you're the one who gets to determine how it will be used. It will be served as a means to what end you determine it will be used for. All right, now the next point is for Kant, um, uh, in order to come up with a scheme of property, in order to come up with a system that assigns to different individuals rights to determine how objects, certain objects will be used, Kant thinks we need a political structure to do that. So Kant thinks that we need uh, a, basically a civil law-making authority in order to do that. So there's not going to be a single natural scheme of property rights. This is something that we create through a political structure. So, right is concerned also then, because it has to be concerned with determining property rights, who gets to decide which objects will be used for what purposes, it also has to be concerned with establishing a legitimate political structure. And of course, in establishing the little legitimate political structure, we need to have some way of ensuring that different people are not used as means within that system. So Kant would say we need a republican system. We would say we need a kind of democracy. Okay, so that's the big picture. All of this, our right to our own body, our right to our property, our right to a uh, legitimate political structure, all of this falls within the idea of the doctrine of right. Um, okay, so I skipped over um, what Kant calls the universal principle of right, which is concerned with external freedom. Um, which is, he says, independence from being constrained by the choice of another. So it's concerned with external freedom. It's not concerned with our ends. It's only a matter, justice is only a matter of other people lim inappropriately limiting our pursuit of our goals. Um, let me say that again. So justice is concerned only with other people inappropriately limiting our pursuit of our or whatever they are. So this means that uh, justice does not require that everybody, um, if I have some end, some goal that I have, and I strive to achieve it, and I fail, so far there's no injustice there. So far there's no violation of right. Justice does not require, is not concerned with what my end is, or whether I succeed or fail in achieving it. But now, if I have some end, some goal, and I strive to achieve it, and you interfere with my pursuit of it by interfering with the means that are legitimately mine, then there's injustice. Yeah. What does Kant say about cooperation or sacrifice? So cooperation is great. Cooperation is when two or more individuals pursue their own goals, their, their ends, by making an agreement with one another, maybe giving up some means that they are entitled to 
in exchange for somebody else giving up means that they're entitled to. Right? That just means that each individual has used their means for their own end, whatever it is. It's great. So cooperation is no problem. That is, I mean, what I, so what I just described was a contract for con, right? An agreement in which I use, I commit some means that I'm entitled to in exchange for you committing some means that you're entitled to. Look, and I'm entitled to use those means for whatever purpose I want. For example, letting you use them. And I can happily give those to you in exchange for you giving me some means that you're entitled to. And that can be mutually advantageous. That can be perfectly consistent with justice. And once, here, and once that agreement has been made, then the other person is entitled to those means. If you then take them back, so to speak, well, then you're interfering with something that rightfully belongs to me. And that's wrong. That's unjust. Good. Um, okay. And last point then um, is this. For Kant, right, justice, necessarily involves, he says, the authorization to use force. And this is a very important point. Um, on 25, he says, I mean, this is section D, he just says that. He says, um, resistance, so like this is like physical force he's talking about, resistance that counteracts the hindrance of an effect, promotes this effect, and is consistent with it. So, uh, now whatever is wrong, he says, is a hindrance to freedom in accordance with universal law. So what is wrong interferes, and a wrongful act interferes with somebody's rightful pursuit, legitimate pursuit of their end. So if somebody is using force to prevent somebody from doing something wrong, that's consistent with justice. That's consistent with somebody's use of means, uh, legitimate use of means to pursue their end. Um, and so this is for Kant a fundamental point about what justice uh, consists in. And I want to uh, try to explain this by contrasting it with utilitarianism. Utilitarian, so we're thinking about the enforcement of rights. For utilitarianism, what is morally correct is what's going to maximize utility, obviously. And suppose now there's some wrong act, some act that is not going to maximize overall utility. Is it utilitarian going to say that we can use force to prevent that act, that wrongful act that is not going to maximize utility? Can we use force to prevent that? The answer is, I don't know. How's a utilitarian going to decide? No matter how it maximizes. Of course. So the utilitarian is going to ask whether using force against that action would result in maximizing utility. So there's a kind of second stage for utilitarians. First, we decide what is right using the utilitarian stage. And then we decide whether we can use force to enforce it using what? Utilitarian standard. Clear? Okay. Kant rejects this. For Kant, there's a kind of necessary internal connection between violations of right and the use of force. And I think it's easiest to see in the case of property. So take